Hi, everybody, and welcome to Astro Nights Live. Once again, we have a fascinating presentation planned for you, and we're very excited that you chose to spend a little of your time with us tonight. Our presentation will be about 20 minutes in length, after which we'll be able to address a few of your questions. Those of you participating on, on Zoom can post a question via the Q&A window. Be sure to hold your question until the end, because it might just get answered during the presentation itself. If you're joining us via YouTube Live, you should know that Q&A is not available, so just sit back and enjoy. Whether you're joining us on Zoom or YouTube, we recommend taking a moment to locate the full screen mode in your app for the best Astronauts View live experience. All of the websites and resources we'll be discussing during our program are available on our website. So don't worry about rushing to write them down. Just relax and enjoy the program. The links will be waiting for you whenever you're ready. You'll be invited to complete an online survey at the close of the program, and we hope that you will take a moment to share your thoughts with us. Your feedback helps us in a planning of future Astronauts Live events. And now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Mary McDonald. Mary is the Planetarium's Program Manager at the FSU Planetarium, and I know she's anxious to get started. Mary? Thank you very much, John. And unlike most nights, I'm going to ask you to leave your camera on uh, because I'm going to turn around and actually introduce John today. So you, if you've joined us for Astro Nights in the past, you have heard John's voice at the very beginning, and he may have you might not know this, but he may have been answering your questions uh, in the Q and A. But tonight, John is going to stay with us as a co-presenter. So John works with us at the Krista McAuliffe Center at Framingham State as a flight director in our Challenger Learning Center. But aside from that, he's also a lifelong astronomer, lifelong amateur astronomer and space buff. He uh, is, has worked as a NASA Solar System Ambassador, uh, and he has a particular passion for planetary exploration. Uh, he loves to share his view of the night sky through observatory telescopes at the public nights, or at least, you know, in, in months past, uh, he would be participating as a telescope operator at the public nights at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, um, and also at the Museum of Science. He also uh, has regularly taught a popular astronomy course at the Center, the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. So he is a real uh, asset to our team and to astronauts. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, John. Thank All you. right, so as usual, we are gonna start our program with a question. So those of you that are watching Astronauts together as a group at home, we'd really like you to talk to each other as you watch and start with the question. So ask each other, shooting star is another name for what? Is it comet? Is it meteor? Is it asteroid? Or a special kind of star that moves really fast? All right, take, uh, take a few moments to answer this question. And actually, for those of you that are on Zoom, um, I can actually launch this as a poll. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So those of you that are on Zoom can enter your answers in the poll. Uh, if you are not on Zoom, if you're on YouTube, welcome. But uh, we encourage you to try joining on Zoom in the future because there's a little bit more interactivity there. All right, 10 more seconds on this question. OK, the answers I'm getting in the poll. Uh, I'm going to stop the poll, by the way, if you want to enter your answer real quick. Now's the time. Okay, I'm ending it right now. And what I'm getting is 50% on meteor and 50% on comet. And I am not surprised to hear that because all of these terms, including shooting star, are often confused uh, for one another. 
So let's let's go through uh, and quickly figure out what the correct answer is. So first of all, nobody that I saw picked uh, this one, a special kind of star that moves really fast. So the phrase shooting star often used by kids, you know, often used in poetry, it, it doesn't refer to a star. So shooting stars are not stars. Uh, there are stars that move, they all move actually, some of them move faster than others, but none of them move as fast as what we call in a shooting star from our perspective on Earth. So not a star, but what about these other things? Comet, meteor, and asteroid, often confused. Um, I'm not going to go in detail about the, the why at this point, but I will tell you that the correct answer is meteor. And these three things, comet, meteor, and asteroid, are all different. So they're all different things. But I think something you're going to be really interested to learn today is that there is actually a connection. So they're different things, but they are related. And it might not be in the way that you think. Uh, I will just give a plug for uh, watching the past Astronauts episodes. Uh, in the last couple months, we did specials on asteroids. So we actually had a, an Astronaut special on Asteroid Day, June 30th. Uh, and so you can learn all about asteroids uh, from that episode. And then in the last two Astronauts, we talked a lot about comets because there was a visible comet in the sky, Comet Neowise. Uh, but today, as you may have guessed, it's all about meteors. So let's take a look now at the night sky, as we often do. Oops, there we go. There's the night sky. Uh, and this is the sky that you are going to see tonight at about 745. I wanted to make sure that you saw tonight's sky, just in case you were hoping to go outside and have a look. And I'm just putting up this little clock here so that you can uh, See what time it is. Okay, so now let's let some time pass. And I think I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to John as the sun sets. The sun's gonna set around eight. Uh, and as it starts to get dark, John uh, will start uh, telling you a little bit about what might be visible as it turns to night. Take it away, John. Thank you, Mary. So uh, you may notice uh, as you look at the sky to the south, you'll see a really bright point of light there. Aside from the moon, it's the brightest thing in the sky. And that's the planet Jupiter, the biggest planet. And it happens to be in a position very close to uh to our position where, well, it's, it's closest to Earth um, in the yearly cycle. Um, and next to it, you'll see a, a much fainter star, star, I say in quotes, uh, because it's actually the planet Saturn. So they're really close together, but I think if we wait a little bit longer into the night, we'll see other objects come up, Mary. There we go. It's now, oh, it's just about two o'clock in the morning and I'm stopping us. So what have we got? What have we got visible now? So we have the moon and something else that's coming into view um, a little bit there it is. Um, so obviously we have the moon and we have the planet Mars. Now Mars is going to be very visible the second half of this year. Right now it's already as um, not quite as bright as Jupiter, but um, brighter than Saturn. And we will be, um, we, we have had two shows already on Jupiter and Saturn. Our next program um, of Astronaut Live on August 21st will concern Mars. So we'll be hearing a lot more about that. Thanks, John. Yeah, so Mars is looking pretty good right now. It's just that you do have to stay up pretty late if you want to catch it. Um, you might have noticed it is after 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and some of you might be thinking, what is that all about? Why are we up so late? 
And I don't usually like to do that to you, especially those of you with little ones at home. But unfortunately for tonight's theme, I, as I hope you know, we're talking about the Perseid meteor shower. Unfortunately, that's kind of how it, how it goes. You either have to stay up really late or um, wake up really early in the morning because that is the best time to observe this night sky phenomenon. All right, so we have got, we're, it's about two o'clock in the morning, but you know, everything that we're gonna be looking at, uh, you'll continue to be able to see until the sun comes up. So this is tonight's sky, and we're gonna start by looking at the stars because we kind of wanna orient ourselves with the night sky by looking for some of the patterns in the stars. Um, maybe I'll turn a little bit more north, and some of you may spot right near the horizon, uh, the Big Dipper. Uh, that's always something easy to look for. Another easy to find constellation in the northern sky that I always look out for uh, is one called Cassiopeia. It's really high up in the northeast right now, so it's going to be like right over your head. Now, I'm sorry, I have to use the silly little hand to point it out. I, I don't have access to my nice pointer tonight. But anyway, look out for um, a shape that looks like a W, so a nice little W or an M. I don't know why we always say W. It could easily be an M. Uh, but that is Cassiopeia. Pretty easy to find constellation. This is one that I always look for in the sky if I want to find the next one that we're going to talk about tonight. And that is just, just a little bit down and to the right of Cassiopeia, a slightly more difficult one to find. This is the constellation Perseus. And the way I always look for this one is I look for like a little wishbone shape. And in fact, I like on the left side of the wishbone, I see like a little like curly Q there. So it looks like kind of like a fun little design. But anyway, that is Perseus. And that is what we're, well, that's sort of the center of our focus tonight because we're talking about the Perseid meteor shower. Now, is there a connection there between Perseus, the constellation and Perseid meteors? Yes, there is. Um, and that's what we're going to find out about today. So the reason that they are called that is because there is something that is called the radiant of the meteor shower that is located right here in the constellation Perseus. So a lot of times when there's something interesting in the sky that's located within a certain constellation, um, we name it after the constellation. And so the Perseid, the radiant of the Perseid meteor shower is in Perseus. So let me just, uh, I'm going to highlight the radiant and, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, here we go. So the radiant is indicated by this little star shape here. Now that is not something you're going to see in the sky. You're not going to see that little thing. That's just showing you where it is. And you can see that there are actually lots of other radiants of meteor showers uh, for different meteor showers. There are lots and lots of these meteor showers, but most of them do not produce a lot of meteors uh, or are not very reliable. So if you hear about some of those in the news happening, a lot of them are not going to be, um, you know, a really great reliable show of meteors. But there are a couple during the year that are very reliable and you're quite likely to see them, and the Perseid meteor shower is one of them. So the, what, what is the radiant? So everybody remember where the radiant is. I'm gonna take away those silly little stars. Uh, it is the place in the sky where the meteors appear to come from. And I think we kind of have to get a sense of what that's gonna look like. So what, what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you what I think is the, the best advice for looking for meteors. All you do is just sit there and look at the sky. So you don't necessarily have to look at the radiant. Just look anywhere and see if you see a meteor. I'm not going to tell you what they're going to look like. Just everybody have a look. And if you see one, tell the person next to you, hey, I think I just saw one. I'm watching. I think I've seen a few. This is what it's really like to watch a meteor shower. You just look up at the sky and you say to the person next to you, oh, I saw, I saw one. So if you have seen one, um, take a look at how they appear 
And now maybe you get a little bit of a sense of what the radiant means. It's the place in the sky where the meteors appear to be coming from, where they appear to radiate from. Uh, so John is going to tell us a little bit more about that. But as we do, just keep watching and keep looking out for meteors. So John, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what observing a meteor shower is like and maybe any tips you have? Sure. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, so the Persons are one of the best showers in most years, but this year the moon is in last quarter phase. And as we saw, the moon is fairly close to the radiant. Um, the moon's light will wash out some of the fainter meteors, but you'll still be able to see a lot of the brighter ones. Um, during a good year, you may see a about 100 meteors per hour. This year, because of the moon, the rate should be half of that or maybe even a less, little less, um, even under dark rural skies. Actually, but, John, sorry, I'm, I apologize. I have to stop you for just a second because I realize I've made a mistake. So <laughs> if you look at the clock, you'll see that it is, it is 2 o'clock tonight. It's, so it's August 8th. And I actually just realized that that's, that's later tonight, but the actual peak of the meteor shower, which is what you were just talking about, is not for a couple of days. So that's why tonight is called prepare for the Perseids, because you're not gonna be looking for the Perseids tonight, it's a couple of nights from now. Oops, there we go. And that's why, um, that's why the moon isn't where John was saying. So the best night to look for the meteor shower is actually on the 12th. So hopefully you all followed me as we went a few days forward in time. We're looking at the same part of the sky um, near Perseus. And you can see that on that night, the moon is even closer to uh, that area, just like John said. So sorry about that. Um, keep going, John. <laughs> OK, uh, but this, the thing is, there's no need to be concerned if we have cloudy weather or you get clouded out. Even though, as Mary says, the peak is in the pre-dawn hours of August 12th, there's some shower activity that occurs from around July 17th to August 24th, but it trails off from the peak on August 12th. And even though most persons will appear after midnight, you may see some as early as 9.30 p.m., soon as it gets dark, which means that kids can watch too. You can actually make this a family activity. Um, it may seem that the meteors are falling over your neighbor's house or the building up the street. This is an illusion though. Most of the trails left by these meteors actually occur at altitudes of 50 to 75 miles up. And the meteors are moving at speeds of up to 144,000 miles per hour. And as Mary mentioned, though the meteors appear to radiate from Perseus, by the time they appear, they can be in almost any part of the sky. Our meteors move too fast for a good view through a telescope, and even binoculars are not necessary. You don't need any special equipment other than your eyes. The best way to observe the meteors is from a comfortable lawn chair. Find yourself the darkest spot you can, and the more of the sky you can see, the better. Don't forget to bring some bug repellent, maybe a warm blanket and a thermos of soup or hot chocolate, because even in summer, it can get very cold in the middle of the night, unless there's a heat wave. So I'll turn it back to um, Mary, but uh, I will point out that um, meteors we see are the debris from the debris tails left by comets. When those particles enter its atmosphere at high speed and we see them, then we see them burning up. That's when we see a meteor. Most meteors are the size of a grain of sand. Mary? Very good, yeah, so thanks. Uh, so these meteors, they're tiny little grains of sand burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and that's one difference between meteors and comets is that meteors are mostly tiny little things. Comets are often much bigger. Uh, but I did notice that you mentioned 
that there is a relationship here between meteors and comets. They're different, but there's a connection. Um, now, in order to really understand that, we're gonna have to leave our comfortable lawn chairs watching the meteor shower and go into outer space because that's where we're gonna really figure out what's going on here. So we're gonna head out to space to get a view of our solar system. And you can see the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars orbiting the sun. And then someone else in the solar system also orbiting the sun. Um, now, that's not something you're gonna often see in textbooks or uh, hanging on a little mobile of the solar system, but there are actually lots and lots of other objects orbiting the sun besides the planets, and many of them are comets. I wanna once again refer you back to the last two astronauts where we were discussing comet Neowise. But this blue orbital path that you see here is the path of comet Swift-Tuttle. And this is the comet whose debris trail is responsible for the Perseid meteor shower. So in the previous astronauts, we talked about how comets are basically dirty snowballs. They're balls of ice and rock and dust. Uh, and as they get close to the sun, they start to evaporate and blow off that dust and, and chunks of dust and rock and basically leave what we call a debris trail behind them. So their, their entire orbital path, but especially the part near the sun, is littered with debris. And you can see that at some point in the, in the orbital path of Swift-Tuttle, the Earth, ooh, sorry, the Earth crosses that orbital path. So there you have, you can see right there, um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this, um, let me reset. Um, you can see that the Earth crosses the orbital path of comet Swift-Tuttle at this one place. And when it crosses through that path with its debris trail, that's where all these little uh, pieces of dust and rock enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, and burn up as meteors. So it's basically the Earth going through a cloud of debris from this comet. And I think I'll, I think I'll give us a nicer, a nicer look at this comet's really unusual orbit. Um, I mean, I should say that it is unusual compared to the planets, but it is not at all unusual for a comet. Uh, most of the comets have orbits that are very elliptical, so they're not circles; they're very elliptical. So they come really close to the sun for part of their orbit, and then they go really far away. Um, and they also move really fast when they're close to the sun and then slower uh, when they're farther away. Uh, and they're, they're also, their orbits are very tilted. We call that inclination uh, compared to the orbits of the planets, which are mostly all in the same plane. So you can see this really kind of interesting intersection. And one of the things I, I really want to uh, emphasize is the fact that just because Earth uh, passes, crosses the orbital path of this comet does not mean that it's going to collide with the comet because they, the comet has a very, very long period, orbital period so, and, and the Earth has its own orbital period. So just because their orbital paths cross doesn't mean the two objects are gonna be in the same place at the same time. Uh, and that's true for all these different objects that cross Earth's orbit. Uh, so you can see this is actually, uh, this is the, you know, current date. And so the Earth is really at the point where it is about to cross into the orbital path of this comet. So just one more, one more note about the difference between meteors and comets. You saw on your screen, and I do hope you all see in the real sky, that the meteors move really, really fast across the sky, just seconds even. Uh, comets, they move fast as well as when they get close to the sun, uh, but nowhere near as fast. So if you got a chance to observe Comet Neowise, you should have noticed that you were mostly looking at one single place in the sky. Um, and the next night you basically looked at the same place because they are moving, but not, not fast. So they're moving a little bit each night and Comet Neowise, in fact, its position started to shift pretty quickly, uh, but still it wasn't moving across your line of sight. So you could fix your binoculars on it to get a nice look. 
But as John said, uh, meteors are an, a phenomenon that, that you can't really look at with your binoculars or a telescope. They're going too fast. So don't worry about any of that. Just sit back, look up, and see who can be the first one in your family um, to observe a meteor. All right, so uh, that is that is our presentation on the Perseid meteor shower for tonight. Oh, except one more one more point. I, I want to say I hope you all got this idea that because um, the Earth takes one year to complete its orbit, it's going to cross this path every year at the same time. So that crossing is at a particular place in Earth's orbit, which means that the meteor shower is going to happen at a particular time each year. So that's why these meteor showers are recurring. That's why the Perseids always occur in August, the Geminids always occur in December, and that's why we have many, many, many years of history of these observations and how people know to tell you which one's a, a good one to check out. All right, so uh, it's the end of our presentation. Um, I want to invite people who are with us on Zoom to ask any questions you might have now. So you should have the Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom window. But while we are, while we are waiting on that, uh, waiting for people to enter questions, I just want to quickly remind you all of our website, which John mentioned at the beginning of the program. So the primary website for the McAuliffe Center, which is the home of the FSU Planetarium and of Astro Nights, is cm-center.org. We really hope you will check it out. Uh, we've got lots of good stuff on our front page, including a, an opportunity to donate to support our programs, but also um, lots of resources for those of you that maybe are still trying to learn at home over the summer or who might be getting started uh, with home learning again pretty soon. Uh, everything that we've worked on, uh, uh, the planetarium staff, is under From the Dome to Your Home. And this is where you will find all of the resources related to Astro Nights. Uh, each page has its own, each event has its own event page where you can find uh, upcoming, or you can find resources related to that program. And you can also see the upcoming and past events. So if you wanna share this with someone later, uh, this is where they'll find everything they need, including the recording link to YouTube to watch it later. Um, also, everybody check out our cool new logos, which are actually inspired by tonight's theme, the meteor shower. Uh, these were designed by uh, our graphic designer, Justine Greenwood, who just graduated from Framingham State University this past year. And uh, she did a fabulous job with that. So look out for more of that branding coming, coming at you in the future. All right, so um, I think I'm gonna check for questions. Let's go back to the solar system. Okay, so I'm actually gonna read the questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand them over to John. Uh, here's a good one. Is there a difference in material composition between asteroids and meteorites and actually let me just let me just take this opportunity to to sort of add on to that question so let's talk about the difference between asteroids and meteors or so what what we talked about tonight was meteors but then there's also two other words that we haven't mentioned yet which is meteoroids and meteorites so go ahead john and let's talk about asteroids meteors meteorites and meteoroids and what they're made out of. Okay, asteroids are, are um, tend to be large bodies, anywhere from a few hundred yards to uh, to to a few hundred, couple of hundred miles across, um, and they're actually made of pretty similar stuff to meteors, um, and and um, namely stone and metal. Um, there's there's iron meteorites and there's stony meteorites and there's there's ones in between which is very similar to the composition of asteroids now here's a a, a more subtle distinction um meteoroids are when 
the objects that when the medias um, are in space before they become medias, actually, when, uh, as Mary said, they're the debris from um, a leftover passage of a previous passage of a comet, those tiny particles are considered meteoroids. Now, when Earth intercepts one of those meteoroids and they enter Earth's atmosphere very quickly, they burn up from friction and we see the trail, which is most of what we've talked about tonight, that is called the media, naturally. Uh, but some of them are big enough to survive all the way down to the ground and to land on the ground or in the ocean or in Antarctica. Um, and um, in that case, they're called the media right. And there's a lot of people that are, are private collectors in the world that, that uh, you know, trade and collect and buy and sell media rights. Okay, cool. So, so I feel like you broke down kind of the difference between the words, but it seems like, like you mentioned, that the composition of these is pretty similar. So it's really comets that are the ones that are pretty different because comets are, off, are almost always icy um, compared to these other rocky things. Now, um, it seems like kind of the, the, the main difference with between asteroids and, and meteoroids is the size of them and, and the sort of their location in the solar system. Would you say that's right? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, meteoroids are, are all over the solar system, but, um, and, and so are asteroids, but meteoroids are the ones that we are particularly concerned with because they, they can actually enter its atmosphere and then we can see them. But, but they're also a danger in some cases to spacecraft uh, because they travel very fast. They can do some damage to spacecraft, but fortunately they're not that common. They're not that dense. And just a quick, uh, I'll quickly illustrate for people uh, the asteroid belt. So in the solar system, oh, I got to zoom out, it's big. Um, <laughs> So I'm illustrating them in green, which is not realistic, uh, green and yellow and blue. Uh, you really, in real life, you can't really see them, but the asteroids are mostly located in pretty stable orbits between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And this was some, you know, we talked a lot about asteroids uh, in our asteroid day presentations, but there definitely is sort of, um, mind the pun, but crossover between these things because we talked, you know, we talked about the relationship between comets and how they can produce meteors. Uh, asteroids can actually do that too sometimes. And then, as you as you would hear in the in the uh, asteroid day discussion, asteroids do are not all in this region in the asteroid belt, and they can even move and change their change their orbits so that they end up uh, going close to Earth and potentially uh, becoming uh, Earth crossing objects. Okay, um, question I have here from a uh, dear friend to the center, Pat Monteith, uh, who was actually one of our speakers for Asteroid Day. Thank you, Pat. Um, is there a good place in the greater Boston area to watch the Perseids without getting eaten alive by mosquitoes? Um, I think I can take a stab at that. Uh, un the answer, unfortunately, is not really. Um, even in, in the center of a city, you may see some of the brighter persons in spite of the light pollution. Uh, but the only way to deal with mosquitoes is to use plenty of DEET or some other insect repellent. Um, otherwise you will get indeed eaten alive. I can actually say that I am a person who is extremely sensitive to all insect bites, including mosquitoes. And I recently moved, I don't want to tell everyone on this where I live, but I recently moved uh, like north of the city. And it has been my experience that there are fewer mosquitoes in this region uh, compared to south of the city, like South Shore. Um, I'm talking about Boston in case anyone doesn't know what city I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my, all, a lot of my family lives um, in the south of Boston and in the South Shore. And there's tons of mosquitoes there. And then of course, anywhere near like woods, swamps, um, standing water, 
uh, there's going to be more mosquitoes. But to be outside for a long period of time, I think John is right that you probably just need to do the bug spray. But I think the good news is that you don't necessarily need to be in a super dark place to be able to see meteors, right, John? Uh, you don't. I mean, ideally, you want to get out into the country where there's not so much light pollution illuminating the sky. You will definitely see more from the country than you will from the city. But even if you have to stay in the city, it, you should see a few, particularly if you wait after midnight on, on the 12th. Um, they, the brighter ones shine through the light pollution. All right, um, I have another question. I don't know how you're gonna interpret this one, John, but it is, what does the radiant of a meteor shower look like? And well, I, can, I can see the confusion that, that might come up with thinking about that. Right, so the radiant itself looks like pretty much like any other part of the sky. Um, the only difference is if you see a meteor somewhere else in the sky, if you imagine tracing the trail back, um, you will, it will appear to have come from the radiant. Uh, so all meteors, all the persons anyway, uh, appear to come from the same point, but um, there's nothing special about that point. If you look through the telescope at the radiant, you won't see anything unique about it other than, you know, maybe a meteorite flashing out of it. Um, but the meteors are, 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 you may see about um, a, a couple of minutes. So it doesn't, it's not like a swarm of them uh, will be coming at you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And it, it almost makes me kind of think about whether it's even a good idea to show the the radiant, I'll, I'll go back to that scene quickly. But yeah, so you can see that I have this label, the Perseids right there. Um, and there's nothing there. It's, it's not a thing. It's not an object. It's just a spot in the sky. And so in fact, you don't even have to look at that spot. That's kind of like, you know, they did the math and figured out the exact spot that it appears to radiate from, but you can more just think of like the Perseus area, like that whole area, like that, that sort of location in the sky. But as John said, like you might see one all the way on the other side of the sky that if you could trace it back, it might appear to come from there, but, but you might see it anywhere in the sky. So great question. And those little star things I showed earlier, don't, don't look for that. You're not, you're not gonna see that. That was just a little uh, icon. All right, I think this is gonna be our last question of the evening, um, which is, uh, so this, was, this, this came up sort of in our, in our initial poll question. Some of you might've been still joining at that time, but are comets and shooting stars the same thing? So, John, you wanna address the, the shooting star name? Uh, yeah, um, they are not the same thing. Uh, shooting stars are actually meteors. They move quickly across our sky and you may see the, um, the trail for about a few seconds at most. Um, comets are, are much further away. They're, they're hundreds of millions of miles away in many cases and they do move but because they're so far away, they move slowly. And I remember seeing a comet, um, hale Bop, that stayed in this roughly the same place in my living room window uh, for weeks. Um, that's because it, uh, they appear to move slowly. And comets are much bigger. They're, they can be dozens of miles wide, even hundreds of miles wide. The tail can be millions of miles long, uh, but shooting stars are just streaks in the sky of small material. As I said, the size of a grain of sand, uh, most typically. So yeah, our, our main theme of the night is meteors and that's what shooting star, that's the real name of what we call shooting stars. Most important to remember, they are not stars. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so I think that's going to do it for Astro Nights tonight. Um, we would love to see you and all of your friends at our next presentation, which is going to be on August 21st. You can find information about that on our website. Uh, and please check out uh, everything else we have going on while you're there. So have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you next time.